Okay, on, on behalf of the NCIC Heritage Center, I'd like to welcome everyone to this virtual event tonight. Um, this event is being organized under the aegis of the NCIC Heritage Center, a project of the National Council of Indian Culture, Trinidad and Tobago. The NCIC Heritage Center, just some brief info, was officially launched in May of 2017 with the basic aim of archiving, protecting, and promoting both the tangible and intangible Indian cultural heritage of Trinidad and Tobago. And this ongoing quarterly distinguished lecture series is one of the several projects taken up by the Heritage Center since its formation. Most recently, the center was appointed as the coordinator for Trinidad and Tobago and other Caribbean countries for the Global Ramayan Encyclopedia Encyclopedia project, which is a project of the, the government of Uttar Pradesh in India. Tonight, um, our topic that is that has been selected actually by our speaker is the Presbyterian legacy in Trinidad and Tobago. And as he has framed it, open door policy and open-minded. We would all know the Presbyterian Church forms an important part of the history of the East Indian presence in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is indeed prudent that this history becomes more well known so that it informs present and future discourses on the history of our indentured forefathers. <laughs> Tonight we are quite fortunate to have as our speaker our presenter, Dr. Jerome Tiloxin, who is currently a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. He's a former primary and secondary school teacher and has written on migration, the Presbyterian Church, trade unionism, politics, and the Indo Trinidadian personalities. He has spoken at various churches, mosques, and temples on topics such as Indian Arrival Day and the Muharram Massacre. He is interested in the culture and has produced documentaries on Ramila and indentorship, which includes the recent documentary, Brown Lives Matter, Overcoming the Horrors of Indentorship. Dr. Tilaksing has spoken at at academic conferences at various universities, including Oxford and Harvard, as well as he has spoken at many local conferences on the Indian diaspora. Recently, he was a panelist on an Indian Arrival Day celebration, Indian Arrival Day seminar, sorry, challenges faced by the youth of Indian diaspora in Trinidad and Tobago which was organized by the High Commission of India and the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Cultural Cooperation. Now a few persons, some of us will know that Dr. Tilak Singh has been involved in activism to find solutions. And he has been a valuable member of the NCIC Hall of Pioneers Project Committee in which he has been an integral part of the compilation of the Hall of Pioneers booklets that document the lives and achievements of persons who have made a stilling and pioneering contribution to Indian culture and nation building. Jerome has spoken, so without much um, more words about Dr. Tiloxin, I would like to ask um, Dr. Jerome Tiloxin to proceed with his lecture to us tonight. Dr. Tiloxin. Hey, Gun. Hidden, idolatry, idol worship. These are some of the words that you associate with missionaries condemning non-Christians. Yes, this was the language and terminology used by the Spanish missionaries in the New World after 1492. And they were used to describe the religion, the culture of the civilizations of Central and South America and the enslaved Africans. The president, Dr. Sharma, members of the NCIC, viewers from other Caribbean countries, and my friends here in Trinidad and Tobago and abroad, 
I'm very honored to be part of this distinguished lecture series. Thank you, Senator, for that introduction and warm welcome. And I want to commend the NCIC for continuing to create this space for academic and intellectual discussion. As with all aspects of history, there are certain narratives, myths that have become enmeshed, entangled with the facts. Tonight, I might appear as an apologist, as a defender of the Canadian mission and their schools and churches. However, their work, which has existed for more than 150 years, has stood the test of time. My interpretations cannot change the facts. But what do I mean by open door policy? It simply means there were no restrictions as to who would enroll in their schools and who could attend their churches and Sunday schools. And, the, and in this context, the term open-minded simply means being more tolerant and understanding and willing to embrace a person or culture. Some of you all might know two important facts that I want to relate. By 1891, the Roman Catholic Church, and this is in Trinidad and Tobago, comprised 42% Indians, 42, and the Anglican Church had 30%, 3-0, and the Presbyterians only 27%. But why am I saying this? Because a lot of times when we think about Presbyterians and we think about the Indo-Trinidadian, you know, we just believe that this was the only Christian denomination, you know, that had Indians in it. And I also want to tell some of those people out here who don't know is that this Canadian missionary enterprise to Trinidad, which began in 1868, was neither the first nor the only Presbyterian presence in the colony. There were earlier Presbyterian missions to this island, and these included the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland, the Free Church of Scotland, and the United Presbyterian Church of the United States. But my focus is on the Canadian mission, which has been controversial. For some academics and researchers, the Canadian Mission Indian, or CMI, was later known as CM, Canadian Mission Schools, were responsible, they believe, for blocking social interaction between the colony's two major races, Indians and Africans. Donald Wood, in his book, Trinidad in Transition, contended that there was a social and religious reluctance for Indians to have their children educated with persons of different religions and from different ethnicities. Lionel Sukaran, in his autobiography, noted that Indians who attended government or other denominational schools, such as the Roman Catholic and Anglican schools, and I quote, were discriminated against as unclean, lice infested, barefooted, and barbaric. Let us examine the attendance of some CM schools in 1874 in South Trinidad. And you all would notice this kindergarten, which is on your screen, kindergarten, which today we know in Trinidad as the ECCE. And you would see here, they mention, this is not my words, this is the caption, children of several races attend, Negro, French, Chinese, and Indian, right? So this kindergarten, it's different from the Canadian mission schools. They are taking care of children. And if you look at that photograph, here's evidence that they were taking care of children of different ethnicities, different religions. They were not just catering for the Indian children. And I also found the attendance of some Canadian mission schools in South Trinidad. And in the list, that I found from 1874, 
you would see children of African descent in Marabella and Picton. There were also equal numbers of children in Wellington and Philippines. And you will see that table just now. If you could see this table here, you will see I highlighted Marabella and Picton where they actually had um, African children, you know, who exceeded the Indians, you know, and as I mentioned, there were almost equal numbers in the Wellington and Philippine Canadian mission schools, DCM schools. So this is evidence. This is not something I made up or generated. This is facts, factual evidence. But let's fast forward to the 20th century. I have interviewed persons who attended Canadian mission schools during the 1920s, the 1930s, 1940s in Takarigua, Tunapuna, Woodbrook, and Sao. And not surprisingly, there was an average of eight to 10 children of African descent and mixed races, persons of Chinese descent and other races in most of the classes. And this is not something confined to the 20th century, it continued into the 21st century. This evening, for a brief moment, I want you to see these missionaries as humanitarians. I want you to see them as philanthropists. Visualize despised and ostracized Indians and their children. The missionaries provided medicine, food, and clothes. That's the facts. The missionaries in their letters, the diaries, the government's official reports provide these facts, but we cannot quantify the emotional and psychological impact. You can disagree with me, but these missionaries, along with the Bible women, the catechists, the monitors, head teachers, pupil teachers, often acted on a regular basis as counselors, social workers, psychologists, mediators, and even doctors. These people were not professionally trained in these fields like social work, but they provided insight, advice, and wisdom for persons who were depressed, suicidal, and victims of abuse. And in this photograph on the screen, you will see some of these early missionaries with some of these recent converts. You know, I edited a book, and the title of the book was The, right, the Missionary's Right Hand, as to tell you how close these recent Indian converts worked with the missionaries. And these recent converts to the Christian faith showed empathy. They showed compassion and love for their fellow Indians who were alienated and marginalized. And I also want you to never forget that alcoholism was rampant among many Indian villages and the missionaries tried to intervene, often unsuccessfully. I want to tell you a story about a barrel filled with crabs, all types of crabs, Muslim crabs, Hindu crabs, Chinese crabs, Syrian crabs, Indian crabs, and African crabs. And, and these crabs are pulling other crabs who are trying to climb out. Sounds familiar? However, the Presbyterian crabs manage to reach the top of the barrel, but they don't leave that barrel. They stay and help the other crabs to escape. And this is the illustration that I want to use when I'm talking about these Presbyterian converts. They went back into the barracks, they went back into the villages to help their fellow human beings. And these Presbyterians had an open door approach and many were open-minded. It was an era of discipline for instilling morals, values, and ethics. But more importantly, these churches and schools were bastions of excellence. In their overcrowded schools, there were disciplinarians who did not tolerate mediocre work. And in the early decades of the 20th century, the Indo-Trinidadians who were exposed to education 
in a Canadian mission school or CMI school would later become dentists, solicitors, merchants, school inspectors, accountants, conveyances, doctors, and dentists. And when I assisted the NCIC with compiling their Hall of Pioneer brochures, I also met some of these icons and legends who had been to Presbyterian institutions. And let me provide a few illustrations of these sons of our soil who benefited from the work of the Presbyterian. Pandit Lakshmi Sharma, a rice mill proprietor and cane farmer, born in 1908, attended DBA CM school. He was the founder of the Krishna Mandir and the Sanatan Dharam Swayan Savak. He was also a strong supporter of Badis Maharaj. Secondly, Haji Sukur Rahamat, born 1894, was a merchant. And in his earlier years, he attended San Fernando CM School. He made a trip to Mecca and he toured India. And also attending the San Fernando CM School, which is today Grand School, was Sheikh Jalil Mohammed, born 1895. His profession was listed as a rated water manufacturer and bottler of wonder drinks. He was the organizer of the Southern East Indian Debating Association. And these are two illustrations I have used, a Haji and a Pandit who attended CM schools and they were not converted. They remain strong in their religions, Islam and Hinduism. And there were other distinguished Indians throughout Trinidad. And I will mention just three more. And these three Indians attended the Shagonas CM school. Chandra Bahadur Mathura, or CB Mathura, politician and journalist. Simbunath Kapileo and Dr. Rudranath Kapileo. All three strong Hindus. Many writers and commentators focus on conversion. And that's the weak point, the weak link of the mission. That's the Achilles heel of the mission. And many of you all, I'm sure you have a grandparent, an uncle, a nephew, a sister, a cousin, who might have attended a CM school, a Presbyterian institution. And this is how it is in the Caribbean where there's a lot of open-mindedness. I too, I also could share a similar story. When I was younger, I, I attended Montreal Vedic School in Central. It was one of the top schools. I didn't attend a Presbyterian school because my parents understood the importance of common entrance, the importance of getting a good education. And that is why they decided to enroll me and my brother and sister in the Montreal Vedic School. So this is what, Trinidad was Trinidad and Tobago, and this is how it is even today. The Canadian missionaries initially intended to spread the good news of Christianity, but their mission took a different path, resulting in resounding success with its schools and its institutions. Arthur Niehoff in his work, East Indians in the West Indies is correct in stating conversion to Christianity offered quick rewards. Morton Class in his study also echoed similar sentiments. So one phenomena of this era was the temporary Presbyterians. These temporary Presbyterians were persons who briefly converted to obtain a teaching job or promotion in a Canadian mission school. A good example is Lionel Sukaran, a Brahmin. He embraced Presbyterianism, and as a result, he was accepted and trained at Naprima Training College and later employed at Ellswick CM School and Debe CM School. He would later return to Hinduism. So this temporary conversion could be a softer, maybe an alternative interpretation, trying to understand the way in which education was used. And interestingly, many famous novelists, Shiva Naipaul, Sam Selvon, 
Vidya Naipaul have all talked about conversion to get jobs, conversion to become respected in society. It was a different era. And this behavior was not limited to that era. It's not something for the 19th century or the 20th century. It happens today in 2020. There are some people who attend church, they get promotion, maybe to ensure their children are on the 20% list so they could attend one of the uh, Presbyterian secondary schools. So these temporary Presbyterians remain with us and they will be there in the future. If you forget my entire presentation tonight, I want to ask you to think about four questions. You might not remember anything I'm saying tonight, or you might find fault with it, but I want you to ask yourselves these four questions. Firstly, if the Canadian mission did not come to Trinidad, what would be the state of literacy in the Caribbean? Secondly, where would the Indo-Caribbean population be today? Thirdly, would the Indo-Caribbean population have been able to advance so quickly and become successful in politics, religion, business, medicine, law, and teaching? And finally, without education, that key to social mobility, how would they have left the barracks and the despised laboring conditions? So it is very obvious a Presbyterian education helped to break those invisible chains of indentureship. Hugh Tinker referred to it as a new system of slavery. Education was the catalyst to leave that manual that was so despised, to leave the plantation, be it the cocoa estate, coffee, coconut, sugarcane estate. Education, especially literacy, was that antidote for the poison of colonialism. But more importantly, the Presbyterian legacy was one of uplifting and empowering the Indo-Caribbean during the 19th century. The colonial era had unleashed socioeconomic forces contributed to a fractured and dysfunctional society. The traumatic immigration process, the uprooting from their homeland India had created alienation amongst the Indians, but the Presbyterian missions sheltered these vulnerable minds and acted as a buffer against these harsh social conditions. Indeed, the Presbyterian church played an invaluable role in the assimilation and acculturation of the East Indian immigrants in this society. This was crucial in a colonial society in which divide and rule was the modus operandi. Indeed, the British had mastered the art of fostering insularity. The group in the Presbyterian Church known as the Bible Women, they cared, they converted, and they counseled many of these Indian women. And this is the open-mindedness. This is the open-door policy. The open-door policy meant females were welcome in the Canadian mission schools. They were welcome in the secondary schools. And the open-minded approach was evident as girls were encouraged to be educated. Indian girls were encouraged to be literate. From 1890 to 1905, the female missionaries built three homes, the Tunapuna Girls Training Home, the Kuva Home for Girls, and the Airy Home for Girls. It can be argued, and I cannot disagree, that these homes westernized these girls, separated them from their culture and their religion, but it also fostered a new lady, a new woman in these Indian girls. And the average age of these young girls being admitted was 12 to 15 years. 
The occupants of these homes included orphans and daughters of Christian parents who wanted Western training for their girls. You can argue that these missionaries, these early converts, were agents of Westernization. And I agree. But this version of Westernization had saved thousands of lives and created upright citizens. Look at the emergence of Naprima Girls High School in the early 20th century. It was a major platform for female education. And I will give you two examples. One of them not well known, Rosie Sheik, born 1923, a medical student. She was a graduate of Naprima Girls High School and studied medicine at McGill University in Canada. And another well-known graduate of NAPS was Dr. Stella Abbott. Other Presbyterian institutions, such as the Theological College, have become synonymous with excellence, recognized for the ability to produce worthy citizens. Presbyterian schools have allowed the freedom and initiative to develop a flexible curriculum to help curb some of our problems. Presbyterian primary and secondary schools are evidence of a harmonious and successful working relationship, not just with the government and NGOs, but also parent-teachers associations. Most of the students in our Presbyterian primary and secondary schools are non-Presbyterians, and a considerable percentage of these students are Hindus. For instance, in the early 20th century, at the Sao CM School, Diwali Eid functions were focused on. At many of these Presbyterian primary schools, at Naprima Training College, Hin was taught and bhajans were sung. Even during the 1980s, during the 1990s, there seemed to have been a cultural revival amongst many of the Presbyterian primary and secondary schools. For instance, there was the introduction in 1991 of Presby Fest, the Presbyterian School Arts Festival, and this was a celebration of creative and artistic talent. And one costume of this, one outcome of this festival was that it fostered fellowship amongst the students. And one of the items was bhajan singing. So that Presbyterians have tried to maintain the ties with their former culture. Presbyterian primary and secondary schools continue to regularly celebrate Diwali and Eid. Schools such as Naprima College and Hillview have included Tassa drumming in their curriculum. I briefly taught at St. Augustine Girls High School and I was very impressed with the elaborate Diwali and Eid functions in which the auditorium was decorated. There were skits, music, dance, and religious leaders of the Hindu and Islamic faith were invited as guest speakers at these functions. So I want you to understand that at many of these Presbyterian schools, there is a remarkable flexibility and tolerance. There's an open-mindedness that might not have been present during the early missionary era of the late 19th century. I have spoken with students at Hillview College, at Naprima College, at Irie High School, and at St. Augustine Girls High School. And they told me that they regularly participate in the annual secondary schools Sanskritic Sangam Convention. They contribute poems and essays. Sometimes these um, poems and essays are published in the school's magazine. At Naprima College, there's an Indian cultural club and they participate in the Victoria District Diwali program. Naprima College also has an Indian cultural club choir and they perform often at the Naprima Bowl or the Diwali Nagar. And interestingly, at Naprima College in existence, 
is a Hindu Students Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And at Naprima Girls High School, there's an Indian cultural club also in existence, and they also participate in the Sanskritic Sangam competition. So I was, I was very impressed, you know, that the, the principals and the teachers and the parents have been encouraging their students and their daughters and their sons to take part in these competitions, to participate in these clubs, you know, and some of the um, activities that they do include making roti, decorating deers, lighting up deers during the wali time, learning to tie the sari, right? Learning to wear the dhoti. Um, so it is very interesting to see this change, a change from narrow-mindedness, a change from maybe myopic views to a more open-minded approach. It's a magnanimous gesture in allowing these functions and clubs it reinforces a tolerance by the school's administration. And interestingly, it doesn't compromise the school's Christian character. And I think this has you know, been one of the hallmarks of some of our schools. I don't want to just limit this discussion to Trinidad and Tobago. And the Canadian clergymen like Reverend Morton and Reverend Grant, they were assisted by family members and they were genuinely interested in not just uplifting Indians in Trinidad, but they wanted to work amongst the downtrodden and despised masses in other Caribbean colonies. There were Indians in other Caribbean islands, other colonies who were alienated and ostracized. And Trinidad served as that base for the Canadian mission. It expanded to Grenada in 1884, to British Guyana, which is today Guyana, and St. Lucia in 1885, and Jamaica in 1894. And it is a remarkable feat of the Trinidad mission to simultaneously continue its good work in Trinidad whilst initiating missionary work in these other colonies. So yes, they were helping the Indians with literacy and food and medicine, but they were also looking at Indians in other Caribbean colonies. And these Canadian missionaries were also indirectly and unknowingly contributing to regional integration. This informal network of missions in the British West Indian colonies promoted unity in a time when communication was mainly through the postal system. And this Canadian mission in the Caribbean provided a foundation for which later the labor movement and politics would build on. However, in assessing the open-mindedness of these Canadian missionaries in the Caribbean, a question arises, and that is, and this is again the weak point, the weak link of the mission. Why did this great mission, why did this great Presbyterian church elect certain islands? Why did they not decide to go to Barbados or Dominica or Montserrat? Also, there were East Indians in Martinique and Suriname, and Cuba and Guadeloupe. But the Presbyterian Church in Trinidad decided not to extend its mission to these French and Spanish speaking territories. Maybe it was the language barrier. Maybe it was the lack of financial money to assist these missionaries because they were not just in the Caribbean, they were also had overseas missions in China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Africa. So it's very difficult you know, to expect the Trinidad mission to deal with and assist all the Indians in the Caribbean. In the post-World War II era, hundreds of Indians, hundreds of Indians, Indo-Trinidadians left Trinidad 
they left the Caribbean and they migrated to United States, they migrated to Canada, and they migrated to England. Now, some of you all might want to know, why did they want to leave this nice island, this nice Caribbean territory with its warmth and its fruits? And the decision to migrate to Canada and to other countries was partly to escape racism under the Eric Williams, the Hoyt, and the Burnham regimes in this country and in Guyana. Others migrated for economic opportunities. They wanted jobs, better jobs. And interestingly, I have interviewed some of these immigrants in these countries. And one thing that they told me, some of them didn't even know I was Presbyterian. Eh? One thing that was a common thread was that they praised the Presbyterian institutions. They said that they earned, they obtained an education foundation from the CMI, the CM schools, from Naparima Training College, from the Archibald Vocational Institute, and they said that this foundation helped them. So this was an asset for the Indo-Trinidadian diaspora. In Canada, some of you all might know, there's a vibrant Naparima Alumni Association based in Toronto and other provinces. And many of these Indo-Trinidadians who are Presbyterians in Canada, they continue to attend Presbyterian churches. Some also attend the United Church. So during the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, when the Indo-Caribbean populations in North America and Europe were small, interestingly, there was some identification with fellow Caribbean migrants, but gradually with an increase of migration, the Indo-Caribbean population had a greater tendency to identify with people of the same ethnic group. And it's very interesting that many of these migrants that I've spoken to in North America and England, they have intermarried with persons from different religions and different ethnic groups. They also continue the Presbyterian tradition of assisting the needy and the less fortunate. So it was some interesting conversations I had with them. You know, they were telling me information that were not in the literature, wasn't in the literature, wasn't in the newsletters, wasn't in official reports. And as we reflect on the legacy of the Presbyterian Church in Trinidad and Tobago, we realize it has experienced a cycle. One of the trademarks of the early Canadian mission in 19th and the early 20th centuries was conversion. But since the 1980s, Many Presbyterians have been converted now. They are being targeted by Pentecostal and evangelical churches. Some of these so-called small churches have converted many Presbyterians. They will tell Presbyterians that they have to be born again if they want to be saved, you know? And even not just the churches, but I'm seeing a cycle even in the performance of some of our Presbyterian schools, especially the secondary schools. And this is partly based on cycles of leadership. As you all would know, during the past five years, Lachmi Girls, with its excellence and scholarships, is now rivaling nearby SAGs. And I have even heard that some Presbyterian families have been um, sending their daughters to Lachmi Girls. So I'm seeing a cycle now where, you know, Presbyterian schools might be losing that space, that forum that they had, you know? But sometimes when I reflect on the Canadian missionaries, sometimes I wish they could return to this country to inject new doses of excellence. Today, some of you all might know, being mediocre is the new normal. Maybe if those Canadian missionaries were here, who we have condemned, they might have cared for that baby girl who was abandoned last month 
in the bushes in Freeport in central Trinidad. Maybe those missionaries who we criticize would have cared for those Venezuelan children. The reports of human trafficking, drug trafficking and addictions seems as if we need to be injected with some of these good old fashioned morals and values. And when I speak values, I am not speaking about European values or Western values. Because a lot of times we associate the missionaries with Western values and European values. I know about the Eurocentric thinking and thought, but the values I speak of and the morals I speak of are needed for a stable and progressive society. Our society in 2020 lacks compassion. We lack empathy. We live in our comfort zones and we display superficial concern. Suppose in the 19th century, the Canadian missionaries had said, I am not leaving comfortable Canada. Let the British government deal with those Indians. Let the wealthy British deal with the orphans and uneducated Indians. So maybe those missionaries should return to help deal with a society that still clings to the cliche of unity and the belief that we are law abiding. You see these missionaries, they had their faults, I agree. But when we see evil and we see injustice, we stay quiet. These missionaries intervene and try to rectify that, even though it was difficult for them because much of their financial assistance was coming from the planters, colonial government, the British government here in Trinidad. So it was very difficult to condemn indentureship. It's very difficult to speak out against this problem. So they were trying simultaneously to solve these problems and to get these Indians out of poverty. And whenever we see evil and injustice, you know, we need to, we need to speak out. In closing, I don't want you all to believe, because it would be very superficial to believe that all Presbyterian schools excel academically. Nothing magical occurs when you enter the Presbyterian schools. Both primary and secondary schools have their fair share of scandals, a lack of discipline. We have shortcomings. We have cliques among the staff. Our churches also have problems. Our congregations are dwindling. But the churches and schools are a microcosm of the wider society. The problems we have in our Presbyterian schools and churches are a reflection of the wider society. And Presbyterians today in Trinidad and Tobago comprise only an estimated 2% of the population. And yet their schools and the graduates of their schools are making an immense contribution to all sectors of society. And I want to pay homage you know, to many of these graduates who have made the school so proud. You know? And um, you, you all could think of many names. You know? And as I talk to you tonight, I think about the Hassan Ali's who served the highest office in the land with such distinction. You know, and it seems as if Presbyterianism in this country's DNA will remain with us for a long time. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tilak Singh. I, um, I like your approach to this uh, particular lecture. You were exceedingly straightforward. And um, what you have pre presented is based on, on, of course, on your research. And um, you, you have put it across in a very direct manner to all those of us who are tuned into this particular lecture.